Well, let's all stand. Let's all stand. Go ahead and stand. Now, some of you are wondering, now, wait a minute. Why are you making us stand up? We just got comfortable, right? I mean, we just got all settled into our seats. Well, if you could just clap for a moment. I've always wanted a standing ovation. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's not, that's not, that's not why. No, no, no. no. <laughs> That's, that's not the real reason. Here, I wanted, I wanted to tell you a story, and I think this story is going to make more sense as you're standing. It's going to be more uh, relevant to you. So this is how it happened. Some friends and I were standing for a movie. You know, we were waiting in line for a movie. It was a movie premiere there for Star Trek. Now, some of you are thinking, oh, have you seen it? You want to talk about No, I'm talking about the original movie that came out in 1979, Okay. <laughs> We're talking about the 79 version. It was 30 years ago. I remember it. I was 12 years old then. Now, it was a huge event, and there were a lot more people than this standing around just like this, you know. It was showing on all screens, and they kind of preempted all this stuff. And we had been waiting for several hours, and there was nowhere to sit. We were just standing like this. And I was holding a big bucket of popcorn that I would basically mortgaged my future for, you know, something very expensive even back then. And all of a sudden, I had that feeling. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling. Maybe you're feeling it even right now. A little strange. The, the noise of the crowd got a little softer. The lights seemed to be getting a little dimmer. It was like I was looking down a tube. And so I handed that big bucket of popcorn to my friend next to me, and the next thing I knew, I was flat on my back on the floor. Yeah, you see, hazy faces, faraway voices, you know, your lips move, but I can't hear what you're saying, that kind of stuff. And people were saying, is he dead? <laughs> no, he just looks dead, you know. And, and I was wishing I was dead because I was, remember, 12 years old. And this is a time when you're trying really hard to be and look cool. And it's real hard to look cool laying on the floor on your back. <laughs> See, the problem was I had locked my knees and I passed out. Now, again, I'm not going to make you stand up any longer. So if you can go ahead and be seated at this point. But think through this. Again, I had us do this not just for a stunt, but for a reason. Because I really want you to get this point, which is, as we think about this story here, tonight's teaching is called Encouraged to Stand. And as you'll see from the slide up here, the word courage in there, as it has been throughout the studies here in 1 Peter, you might ask, why would I need to be encouraged to stand? Why would I need courage to stand? Isn't standing kind of easy? Isn't it just kind of automatic in a way? Well, not necessarily. See, after we fall, well, we have a new appreciation for what it is to stand. And unless we have an injury or maybe an illness or something like that, standing for a minute or two, like we just did, it's not that difficult really for most of us. But after a while, well, if I still had you standing, and if 30 minutes later I still had you standing, well, you might start to say, hey, this is getting kind of hard. I want to sit. I want to maybe even lie down, you know. And if things are getting hot, if things are getting pressured and all that, like it was there that day for me, well, all of a sudden, you can be pretty lightheaded. You can say, man, I just can't stand it anymore. And pretty soon, there you are on the floor. Now, again, I'm not talking just physically here tonight, of course. I'm using the analogy because throughout the Bible, that's the analogy used. The Bible over and over again says we are to stand. Maybe you're familiar with that famous verse in Ephesians 6. You don't need to turn there. I'll just shortcut it for you. He's talking about spiritual warfare, and over and over again, he says, stand, that you might be able to stand. Just stand, that when the evil day comes, you're going to be able to withstand and stand. You know, he says it so many times that you get, man, I'm starting to get it. He wants us to stand. See, and here's the thing. Standing takes courage and encouragement when it comes to the spiritual things. Why? Because life is a battle. It's a fight. I can't help but think of another movie from back then, Rocky Balboa. You know, there with his wobbly legs and his kind of blurred vision and all, the, all that, you know, knocked down for the how many times, I don't know. And you're out there in the audience going, get up, Rocky. And part of you saying, stay down, you know, but no, get up. You got to get up, Rocky. And just seeing him fight just to stand, but then stand and fight. See, and I love the quote that came from one of his recent movies. I think it was Rocky 45 or something like that. <laughs> but this is what it said. Now he's just fighting to stand, you know. But this is what he said to his son. I love it. He said, you know what? It's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit. 
and keep moving forward. That's what makes a great fighter. And so if you found that your life, your life of faith has a fight element to it, well, you know that you might along the way need some encouragement, that you're going to need some courage when it comes to standing, and if you fall, to getting back up and going on. So you might need someone to come alongside and say, hey, get on up. And certainly it's going to be by the grace of God that we're able to do that, not because we have anything special in ourselves. So again, encourage to stand, courage to stand. That's the idea tonight. As we look at 1 Peter 5, starting in verse 5, and we're going to look through the end of the book there, just those verses through verse 14. And it's some parting thoughts here from Peter, again, remembering he was writing to an audience here that was facing trials. And of course, you could say, well, isn't everyone always doing that? Yes, but this was a very special pressured time in human history. It was a time when the church was under great, great persecution. And so he knew that his readers were in danger of failing, of falling, of that fear again of falling, of, of giving up, of giving in. And so he knew that they needed courage. They were going to need courage just to stand in their faith. And so, again, some lessons that we learn here tonight, we'll look at three main ones. If you want to stand strong spiritually, let me give them to you right up front so you, if you go to sleep, you'll at least have these in your notes. <laughs> Number one, lose your pride. Lose your pride. If you want to stand, lose your pride. The second one, use your guide. Use your guide. And then third, choose your side. Those are the three things that we're going to look at tonight. Lose your pride, use your guide, choose your side. So let's look first at the lose your pride part. It's there starting in verse 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, and this is what it says. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now, just stopping there in verse 6, this is what we see. If you want to stand strong, lose your pride. Now, most of us, of course, if someone were to ask you, are you proud, you'd say, no, I'm humble and proud of it. But see, to, to make sure that we follow the thought here of Peter, from the first part of the chapter, see, he was talking first about elders and two elders. You may remember there, and I just want to give you a pair of statements that will kind of tie these two things together here. It's a powerful paradox of the Christian life. You know, the Christian life, the Bible, in fact, is full of all of these seemingly uh, interesting statements that Jesus said things like, hey, if you want to live, you're going to have to die. And you go, what? How can that be? It's a paradox. Well, here's one of them here, this pair here. The way up is down. That's what we looked at last week with Pastor Pedro. The way up is down. But this week, we're going to look at the way down is up. Now, let's review the first one quickly. The way up is down. What does that mean? Well, again, if you were here last Wednesday, the first part of this chapter, you know, Pastor Pedro just took us through a study there entitled Encouraged to Lead, to Lead. And see... I would really encourage you to get that message because everyone here in this room is leading someone. Even if you're just leading your own life, there's a lot to learn through those things. But it talked a lot about what godly leadership looks like. Is it a proud person? Is it an arrogant person? Is it a person who says, hey, everybody should serve me because I'm the leader? No, in fact, he said, again, it's, it's all tied into that word humble. Humility. According to God's word, the way up is down. Humble yourself and God will lift you up. See, the world says the way up is up. If you listen, that's really the message. The way up is up. You know, look out for yourself. Look out for number one. Put yourself in that position. You know, you've got to believe it and achieve it and receive it and all these things. Climb the ladder of success. You know, it doesn't matter how many people you step on on the way up. You're not going to have to deal with them anyway, and they'll just be your servants as you get to the top. But Jesus said, hey, if you want to be great in God's eyes... The way up is down. Become the servant of all. And so you think about that, we'll see tonight that the opposite is also true. And it seems just as paradoxical sometimes. The way down is up. 
See, if a person is puffed up in pride, there's really only one place for them to go from up, which is down. See, verse 5 says, God resists the proud. That's a very important little thing to get into our minds. The word resist there, it literally means to stand against. And it's kind of like there was that popular phrase, hey, talk to the hand, you know, where you're putting your hand out and putting it in somebody's face. That's actually the picture being painted here with this word. Almighty God giving you a stiff arm in the forehead. Now, that's what it's saying there is it says God does that to the proud. So if you go up against God in life, you will definitely go down. It's just that simple. And so again, the first thing we're talking about here today, if you want to stand, if you want to stand spiritually, if you want stability in your life, lose your pride. That's something that we all have to do. The Bible says it so many ways. I'll just give you a few quotes here from the Scriptures. Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. When pride comes, the Bible says, then comes shame. A man's pride will bring him low, it says. And this is a great one for tonight. It says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands, well, let him be careful. Take heed, lest he falls. You know, sometimes a person says, oh, this isn't for me. This message isn't for me. I'm standing strong. Well, let that person beware, lest they fall. Taken together again, these scriptures bring us to the unavoidable conclusion here. You want to stand? Lose your pride. If you want to stand strong, again, it's a strange paradox, but if you want to stand strong, you have to admit you're weak. You have to admit, admit that you're weak, and that takes a certain strength to admit that. Admit you need help from God and maybe even from some others along the way. See, as Peter here was talking about elders. He's talking about olders. You know, and as I've gotten older, one of the things that I know is the longer you go, if you really pay attention, you realize how little you know. The more you learn, you realize how little you know. But it's talking there to the younger people, and, and one of the things that you could say to that, if, if you're younger, I guess younger than I am, that makes it everyone 41 and below, listen up, okay? Admit you don't know everything. And that's one of the things that is really a big deal for some. But listen to the leaders in your life. God will put leaders in your life. And one of the things that shows wisdom is to listen. See, there's an inherent pride in youth. You know, growing up, I thought I was so much smarter than everybody older. You know, that, that they were a bunch of morons. You know, that my parents, the teachers, all of that, they had no idea what I was going through. They had no idea what I was facing. They didn't understand life very well, and I could teach them a thing or two. And I think about Mark Twain. You know, he was one of those authors that they assigned to us, and I didn't read till I was older. But this is one of the things he said. My father learned a lot while I was growing up. See, he said, when I was 15, this is Mark Twain talking, he says, when I was 15, my father was a fool. He knew nothing at all. But by the time I was 20, he had learned a little bit more. He had some wisdom by that point. And now that I'm older, well, my father has become quite the genius. See, and the thing that he's using there, that subtle satire of realizing, no, it wasn't his father who needed to learn. It was the son who learned how much the father already knew. And see, as you think about these words, they're not words I liked when I was younger. I'm not sure I like them that much now sometimes, but submission, no, don't like that one. Humility, humble, try throwing those around uh, with your kids sometimes. They go, I don't like those. But remember, these are not just for the young. See, he says, verse 5, all of us, all of us, all of you be submitted and humble with one another because we never outgrow our need for humility. In fact, the more we go in life, the more humility we're probably going to need. And so he says, be clothed with humility. And I like the Bible because it gives pictorial understandings of things. So I'd like to share these with you as we see them. It says, be clothed, you see that in verse 5, with humility. And that literally means to take up the servant's apron. You know, the, the servants in those days would wear certain clothes, a towel around the waist. And that's what he's talking about right here. And I know, because we know Peter and his life, it was there in the Bible, we know that he was probably picturing Jesus wrapped in that servant's towel as he washed Peter's feet in John 13. It's a classic. Maybe you know about it, the Last Supper there, you know. 
that famous painting and all the rest that, that goes there. Well, the night before the crucifixion, Peter was having a discussion with the disciples. And it was a common argument that they had. It was, who's the greatest? And at that very moment, the Bible says, Jesus was down clothed with humility, washing their feet, taking the role of the lowest servant. And Peter didn't even understand it back then. He was fighting against what Jesus was telling him. And he said, you'll get it someday, Peter. I promise you'll understand this someday. And that same night, Jesus told Peter this, Peter, you're about to stumble. You're about to fall. You're about to fail. In fact, all of you guys will. You're going down, Peter. I hate to tell you. And Peter rebuked the Lord. Have you ever done that? No, Lord. Never put those two words together. No, Lord, you know. Those don't go together well. He's either Lord and it's yes or he's not Lord if it's no. But he says, you're wrong, God. I mean, you're wrong, Jesus. I will never deny you. Never, 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 ever, ever, ever. The rest of these losers might. I mean, we were just talking about that. I'm sure they will. But I will never let you down. And again, I don't know if Someone could have those thoughts sometimes as they say, they look around the world and say, man, everyone's blowing it, but I am going to hang in there for Jesus. I'll never let him down. But see, as Jesus was there being led to the cross, the reason he was being led to the cross is because all fall, even Peter. He went to the cross for Peter because Peter's a sinner too. And so there's Peter denying the Lord. He had to learn that the hard way. And he became humble through humiliation. See, you think about that, I would rather be humble by choice than to have humiliation come into my life. Again, one of the things I'm trying to learn is at least learn that all lessons get learned either the easy way or the hard way. And I love to read about other people's mistakes. Ooh, Peter, yeah, that's a good one, man. I gotta remember that. Peter gets embarrassed, and let me not make the same mistake. You know, but humiliation sometimes has to come into our life to humble us. And so Peter had his pride popped over and over again. You know, his balloon would get blown up and some had to come in and pop it. He became faithful through failure. And I remember hearing an interview there with a, a prominent uh, business leader, you know, someone who had reached some success in life. And the interviewer was asking him, how did you become so successful? You know, and the business person there said, by making good decisions. It seems like a good answer. All right. Uh, but the interviewer wasn't satisfied with that, and they said, well, how, do you make, how did you make good decisions? And they said, well, through experience. So they pushed it a little further and said, well, where did you get your experience? And the man smiled and said, well, by making bad decisions. See, and in life, that's so often the case. How do you get experience? Well, the tuition of it sometimes is making bad decisions. That's how you learn to make good decisions sometimes. And so Peter here is the perfect person to teach us. Why? Because he's such an imperfect person. He's able to tell us how to stand because he knows what it is to fall. And because he was like that, honest, humble, through humiliation sometimes, he was able to say to us, not as a proud person, but as a humble person, hey, lose your pride. We need to lose our pride, guys. See, Peter was prone to pride, to self-exaltation, to selfishness, to self-confidence. He had more than his share, in a way, of shame and failure along the way to his success. But along the way, he did have success spiritually because he learned his lesson. See, he humbled himself under the mighty hand of God, and look how God exalted him. Look how God used him. There's a time in the book of Acts where he preached and 3,000 people gave their lives to the Lord. But that didn't come easy for Peter. He had to stick his foot in his mouth a lot of times until that day came. And so before we leave verse 5, I want to spend just a little bit more time in this sentence found here because it is absolutely crucial to our lives. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. See, grace is one of the most amazing things that we could ever experience, but it tells us here how to experience it. See, one of the most important principles, again, God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. I put it in my notes this way. God resists the proud. He assists the humble. You know, that helps me remember it, just to think of resistance or assistance. Which one do I want from God? Well, I know what I need. I sure don't want a straight arm from God in the forehead. I need him to lift 
me up. I need him to hold me up. See, it's given to the humble. That's what grace says, there, what the Bible says there about grace. That a person who realizes they need grace, what is grace? Undeserved favor. That's a person who's humble enough to say, I don't deserve what God is giving me. See, it's a common quote in our culture that God helps those who help themselves. You know, if you ever look that up in the concordance, you're not going to find it. Why? It's not in the Bible. It's not there. See, the truth is, as we see here tonight, God helps those who admit they cannot help themselves. See, when they come to a point of saying, self-help, forget that section in the library. I need God's help. I can't help myself. And so that's the humility that we have when we come to it. Verse 6, it says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Now, I don't know about you, but... Certain phrases in the Bible bother me. I don't like in due time. I wish it said in three weeks or whatever or four weeks or something that I could say, you know, all right, I'm ticking off the calendar. Um, you know, I've humbled myself, Lord. It's been a week and a half, you know. I, I mean, I, I think I'm the most humble person I know at this point. I mean, I've been watching all week, and I don't think anyone's been as humble as I have been. You can exalt me now, huh? But see, God's answer would be, go, uh-oh. It just got a little later on due time, you know, because it's one of those things that you see in the life of Moses. See, his due time, well, for him it took 40 years of humility and humiliation, really, in the desert, kind of chasing a bunch of sheep before he was ready to face the Pharaoh with let my people go and to take those people through the wilderness there with miracle after miracle in his life. But you know what? He didn't see a lot of excitement there for those 40 years. For Joseph, in due time, how long was that? Well, he was thrown into a pit. Decades went by in which he would have thought, man, I have decayed, you know, this isn't working. I'm put in a prison somewhere, falsely accused. How can I say God is with me? And yet, in the end of that, he again was exalted by God in a day, the Bible says. It doesn't take long for God to exalt the person, but it can take a long time for God to humble a person and God knows how high he wants to take our lives but he knows how low they have to go to go that high and not burn out not bake out see I love the way it says in verse 7 casting your care upon him now this is one of those great comfort verse it stands alone like that cast all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you you know makes a nice embroidered pillow but let's look at the context of it too why did peter put it right here in the midst of this discussion of humility well i think for this reason pride says i can carry my own cares i can carry my own cares i can take care of my own cares see recently i was moving a very hot, heavy object that's kind of part of life overall you're just always moving something especially if you're married you're just moving things you know i i have a theory that the only godly furniture is wicker that's my uh you know <laughs> But uh, that's just me, you know. But anyway, we're going to move something, you know, at the house. And, and Lynn had to go do something. She said, I'll be right back. Don't try to move it yourself. Now, she knows me. I'm going to try and move it myself. That's the way I am. And I got impatient. You know what? I almost went home to see the Lord. I'll just put it that way. I almost got crushed <laughs> by this thing. But in the same way, you know, this is the whole thing that we'll get impatient with the Lord. And we'll get lacking humility getting pride, puffed up in pride, and I carry my cares myself. I can do it myself. You know, I remember the kids. That was their favorite phrase when they're little kids. I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. And we get crushed under the weight of life. You know, oh, I'm carrying my cares. And the Lord has said, hey, I never built you to carry that alone. The humility that it takes to say, I'm going to have to get some help here. And see, so you note the last part of this verse. Again, I love it. He says, because he cares for you. God values you. That's what that means. See, and a lot of people think humility, I think this is a word worth talking about because it's, in its biblical sense, very lacking in our society, I think, overall, an understanding of what it is. See, I think a lot of people think humility means you go around telling everyone how worthless you are. You know that, oh, I'm a Christian now, I gotta be humble. So what does that mean? Well, I'm so humble. You know, I have no talents. I have no abilities. I'm a nobody. You know, uh, I'm ugly, I'm stupid, I'm a waste of skin. But man, am I humble, you know? <laughs> you go, wow, that's great. 
So here's the thing. That's not humility. That's just the other side of pride. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, here's the thing. One type of pride thinks highly of self all the time. But the other type of pride thinks lowly of self all the time. Notice either way, the focus is on self all the time. See, humility is just not living such a self-centered life. It's living a God-centered existence. And it's seeing yourself like God sees you and God values you. Because of your worth? No. No. Because he thinks you're worth everything. See, God here is the source of real humility. Spending time with God is what actually makes a person humble. You know, not down on themselves, not up on themselves, but up on God. See, God cares for me. That frees me to care about others. God's given me gifts and abilities. Okay, they can be used to bless others. But I need the gifts and talents and abilities of others that God has given them. See, I, nobody is an island. God uses us in those ways. And I can think about God. I can think about others if I don't have to always be ca- caring about myself. But the Bible said I was supposed to cast my cares on God anyway so that I could care about other things. See, if you want to stand strong spiritually, you need to lose your pride. You need to, second of all, use your guide. Use your guide. And that's what it says there in verse 8. This is our guide that we're looking at right now. Verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Again, as I give you that second phrase there to think about, use your guide. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, imagine yourself on a jungle safari. Not an air-conditioned little tour bus at the zoo. I'm not talking about that, you know, with the medicated animals that just kind of yawn at you and things like that. No, I'm not talking about the Disney ride here with the animated animals all singing It's a Small World and stuff like that. No, I'm, I'm talking about... A real-life safari with real, live, hungry lions seeking to devour you. You're thinking, what's for lunch? And they're thinking, you are. Now, the guide, think about this, gathers you in close as you're about to set off on this adventure and says, welcome to the jungle, baby. You're going to die unless you stay sober, unless you be vigilant. If you do what I tell you when the lion comes... I'll show you how to resist him. I'll show you how to stand strong and steadfast. Well, let me ask you, would you listen to that guide? Would you learn from that guide? Would you use your guide? Or would you say, I don't need a guide. I'm going to go off on my own. That's where the real adventure is. No, see, spiritually speaking, God's word is exactly that. God's word is our guide through the jungle of life. And so we have an enemy, the Bible says there. We have an adversary. It's not a nice word being used there as it's talking about lion again it's not you know the disney version of that it's talking about resisting a carnivorous animal that wants to gulp you down now it says to resist him how in my might no that would be a proud thought you know that i have the might to resist the devil no it says strong in the faith strong in the faith steadfast in the faith see the more of God's word, the more of God's guide I have in my life, the more you have in your life, the more we will be able to resist the devil. The more we will be able to see him coming a mile away. And to live as an unbeliever, really, or to live as a person who says, well, that can sit on the shelf. I don't really need my guide. You know what that is? That is to say, I can handle my life in the jungle alone. I'm not worried about the devil he won't get me i can beat the lion myself you know i'll take him on but i would encourage you if that's the way you're living please 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 lose your pride use your guide you know come to the bible and realize man i need this i do need the instruction book i do need the guide for life because again as you think about it this guide tells us some of the things we need to change. And the first one that we talked about is pride. It was pride that even made Satan Satan. See, God didn't create him originally that way. He was an exalted angel, the Bible says. And he became the prince of demons. How did that fall happen? Well, if you jot down Isaiah 14, there's five statements 
They're called the I wills of Satan. And this is what he said, I will ascend, you know, I will be like the Most High. And he goes on to, I will, I will, I will do all these things. And guess what? God said, no, you won't. And so the devil there found out that the way down is up. He lifted himself up and God put him down. And it's the same thing that will happen in our lives if we go the same way. See, pride came before his fall. But you see, it also became, it came before the fall of mankind. See, the devil has been appealing to our pride ever since. You know, that's his motive there. He knows what pride is all about, and he knows what pride does. And he's one of those guys who's like, he knows he's going into the lake of fire, but he says, if I'm going to be thrown in the lake, I'm taking as many with me as I can. Kind of like one of those guys at a pool party who decides, hey, if he's going to get wet, you're going to get wet too. But the devil there, he's been appealing to pride. He tempted Eve with pride, really. You know, if you look at the Genesis account there, you'll see he said, eat this and you will be like God. You will be able to lift yourself up if you'll just do this in disobedience. He tempted Jesus all those years later in the wilderness there with really the same set of temptations, just a different context. But what did he say to Jesus? Hey, be your own boss. Do your own thing. Turn these, into, these rocks into bread. Throw yourself down from the temple. Do your own thing. Act out of accordance with God's will. And so if you think about it, again, it says your adversary. It doesn't just say an adversary. What does that mean? Well, God's a personal God, but it also means we have a personal enemy. And a lot of people don't really think of it that way. But it's very important to see it biblically that, that way because I do a lot of talking with people and I've certainly done a lot of talking with the Lord about my own life in some different ways. And I know the mistakes I've made, man, I really could have seen them coming if I'd just used the guide. <laughs> I could have seen it coming. It wasn't like it was real sophisticated. And again, I do a lot of relationship counsel. I do a lot of counsel with people biblically. And one of the things I see again is, wow, just even... A little bit of knowledge of God's word would have prevented so much pain in so many lives. And so that's one of the reasons that we are so passionate about God's word here as a church. Because we know it's a matter of life and death. Now again, some might be saying, Pastor Scott, you know, here's the problem. It's way too late for me. I am already the lion's lunch. You don't understand. He ate my life. I think maybe there's one pinky still sticking out his mouth. That's about what's left of me. But see, what's great about that is you think about God. He is in the resurrection business. That's what he's all about. And if our failure helps us lose our pride and gets us to commit to use our guide, it's not a failure. It's a success. It's God succeeding in teaching us the lesson we need to know in life. See, I think about this. Before Peter's big denial, Jesus had told Peter directly, listen, Peter, um, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. Now, I don't know if you've ever had the Lord give you a message that you didn't like very much, but I wouldn't have liked that one at all. Are you sure? He asked for me by name. He said that. What does sift by wheat mean? I mean, I've done some baking. I see what they do. It doesn't look fun. Um, I think I would have been asking Jesus, uh, can we prevent that? Is there a way to not do that? But he says he wants to do that. But when you return, what does that suggest? That suggests you're going to go on a little trip here. You're going to go on a detour. When you return, he says, strengthen your brothers. In other words, what is Jesus saying to Peter there? You are going to fail. You're going to flop, but it's going to be a success. Why? Because you're going to find out just how weak you are, Peter. You didn't know that yet. I knew it, but you didn't know it. And when you return, you're going to come back and you're going to strengthen your brothers. You're going to come back and write First Peter and Second Peter too. Now tell everyone... Peter, that the way up is down and the way down is up. You know, if we can just remember that, next time we think, man, I, I'm going to puff myself up in pride and that will bring me success. No, that's going to bring you down. The next time you say, Lord, how can I be great? How can my life count for something? He says, be the servant of all because the way up is down. Tell him to watch out for pride because, you know, nothing makes us more vulnerable to Satan than that. It's like he can smell it a mile away. You know how they say that dogs can smell fear? Well, I believe the devil can smell pride. Woo, smells like some pride. I'm going to have a good meal here today. And so he says, 
there, lose your pride. Use your guide. We've seen what the devil wants to do with your life. What does God want to do with your life? Well, what God wants to do with our life is bring life to it. See, the, the devil, it says, the lion wants to devour. But there's another lion in the Bible, the lion of the tribe of Judah. It refer, refers to Jesus that way. A different kind of lion. Now, what does God want to do? John 10.10, 10. maybe you know that verse. I hope you do because it is our mission statement here, our vision statement as a church. John 10.10. 10. And if you have seen it on our cards or you've seen it on our uh, different bulletins and, and soon you'll see it all over the place because we want to remember it. It's bringing people to life where Jesus said, you know what? I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what Jesus wants to do. Not devour you. He wants to bring you to life. But maybe we aren't as familiar as we could be and should be with the first part of that verse because John 10.10 10 is kind of a long verse actually. And the first part of it gives a contrast. The thief, it's talking there about the devil, does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. Now, that wouldn't look as good on the card, would it? You know, hey, come to my church. You know, well, what's it about? Oh, steal, kill, and destroy. Um, no thanks, I'm busy that weekend. You know, or whatever. But you see the contrast. This, again, is why we feel so strongly about what we feel here, because the lion is lying to people, and he as Jesus wants to bring you to life, believe me, the devil wants to bring you to death. Now, he may not say it that way. He's not going to sell it that way. Thieves don't knock on your door and say, Hi, here to steal, kill, and destroy. Let me on in. But you see, using your guide, you can see and smell the lies of the lion. See, our guide here, the Bible, it's going to bring us to Jesus. It'll bring us to life. It'll expose the lion's lies in our life because that deception can be so easy. It's just to resist him. How? Well, right there you see it in this section. How do you resist the devil? Well, some people think it's, you know, we're going to stomp on the devil tonight. You know, we're going to do that kind of stuff. And you go, wait, wait, wait. It's nothing like that. In fact, humility and faith. That's what you see in this context. Humility and faith. See, humility is I cannot, but faith is Jesus can. See, that's a great balance to live your life in. That's what standing requires is balance. I cannot, but Jesus can. And so I love those two verses where Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Some people just live there. Man, I guess I can do nothing. No, how about Philippians 4? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So humility and faith, those two always go perfectly together in the Bible. They will be... Your friends, humble, I can't. Faith, God can. Humility defeats the devil, clothed with humility. When we're clothed with that, he can't get a hold of us. The teeth don't stick. He can't bite us that way. But puffed up in pride, certainly, we are like a big corn puff. You know, just good is gone. He can get us so easy that way. Now, you see in verse 9, this is also a little way to resist the devil which is to understand that there are others going through the same sufferings. Now, you might initially think, well, how's that going to encourage me? Isn't that going to discourage me when I look around and see everyone else having problems? No, I don't think it does. In fact, I've seen in my own life and in the lives of so many that one of the devil's favorite strategies is to isolate us, to get us thinking that there's nobody else who has ever gone through or will ever go through what we are going through, that we're somehow the one exception to the rule of God loving and being love. You see, lions love stragglers. I don't know if you've ever watched the Discovery Channel, but they don't just dive into the middle of a pack. They always look for the one that's kind of like looking around and, you know, straggling behind, and then you start hearing the music and everything else. <laughs> but that's it. The, the devil will get you having a pity party table of one. You know, just by myself here, I'm the only one still standing in all of Dade County. You know, I'm the only one having to go through what I'm having to go through and suffering. I'm all alone. You know, you've heard me say it before, WMS, why me syndrome? You know, why me? I'm the only one. Why would God do this and allow this? But see, what's great is that is not new to us. Elijah, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, had WMS at one point. I alone am left, he said, from the cave. You know, he was a caveman there. 
And God comes to him in the cave and says, Elijah, Elijah, relax, man. There's 7,000 others right in this region who have not bowed their knee to Baal. I mean, there are people standing all around you in the same suffering that you are. And when we realize that, when we don't allow ourselves to get isolated, that's when we find out that we can stand strong together. And we can stand stronger together than we can apart. And so verse 10, you say, But may God, the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Now, as you think about this right here, it's kind of interesting. At the end of verse 10, it's, it's a prayer request there. You see Peter giving a prayer request because he says, May, may the God of all grace. He's giving a little prayer right in that thing. And he's giving a prayer for stability. Now, if you've paid attention in life, you know physically that instability is really a sign of immaturity. I mean, it's one of those things that even a baby, you know, when babies are first born, they can't stand. You know, if you, if you hold them up, they, they go right back down, you know, that sort of thing. And they just lie there like a lump. You know, we took a billion pictures of them just lying there on the thing. It's like, okay, move them a little. It's like claymation, you know, you can make little pictures. And, but they, they don't really move. They can't stand. And once they do stand, they start walking and everything else, and you wish they'd go back to being a little lump where you could, you know, keep them in one place. But I went through so many phases, even as I grew up, you know, as a teenager, I look back through the pictures sometimes, and it's like, okay, one week I was a peacenik. You know, I was all wearing the, uh, the, the army clothes and the Beatles thing, and I was like, you know, fight war and all the rest. And then, the, like, you turn the page in the thing, and now I'm a heavy metal guy. You know, now I'm going to all the concerts and kill, and you know, all this sort of stuff. And then new wave, you know, now my hair looks like flock of seagulls or something like that, and you're... What's going on? You know, why is it the flip of the page? This guy's all over the map. Well, I didn't know who I was or what I was supposed to be doing in life. But see, it's real sad when you see adults still kind of going through those phases and fads and everything else. You know, blown by the wind. Because at least it's supposed to be that with maturity comes some stability. Spiritually, the same thing's supposed to be true in our life. As we know the Lord longer, you know, there comes a point where the God of all grace is able to establish us, that he is able to be perfecting of us, you know, completing us. He's doing something to settle our hearts and strengthen us. And again, I think of this as a prayer, as he's saying, hey, may God do this in your life. But think about it this way. If you're saying, man, I, I want to stand, I want to be stable, all the rest, Peter could you pray for me? You know, if you were there at the church at the time, you know, Apostle Peter, could you pray for me? He can't pray for you now. Don't get the wrong theology here. I'm saying if you were back there in this first church, you know, and he says, puts his hand on you, oh, Lord, give them stability, perfect them, complete them, settle them, and you're like, amen. And he goes, after they've suffered a little while, no, 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 Peter. I don't like that part of the prayer. Leave that part out, you know. Highlight that with a Sharpie marker so you can mark it out. I don't want it there. But see, that's exactly how it works. You know, we know this because God teaches us things in the physical that are spiritual. I worked for a couple of summers for a home builder, you know, and, and putting together uh, homes, but I was like the scrub of scrubs. I was the guy who had to do all the dirty work that nobody else wanted to do because I was just in high school and I didn't know anything, you know. So I used to have to run this heavy machine there that they had that compacted the earth for the foundation. I don't know if you've ever run one of these or seen a guy do them, but I mean, it's like you pull this thing and it's like gagoon, gagoon, gagoon. And finally, by putting yourself on the thing and riding it around, it gets down to where it's compacting the earth, okay? It's and I would run this thing for hours. I'm talking hours, you know? And back and forth through the foundation of this thing, back and forth, back and forth, compacting the earth over and over again. And I think it explains a lot in my life. You know, it kind of scrambled the egg, so to speak. But, but the whole purpose of that shaking there was a strong foundation for the home. See, if they had just come in and built on the dirt, the house would have cracked. So instead, you know, I'm cracked. But, but at least those houses, if you go back and look at them there in Colorado, they are firm and stable, you know, even if I'm not. So what, did, what happened there? They had to shake things up to settle them down. And I think the same thing happens in our hearts sometimes, that God has to shake things. The Bible even says that he will shake all things 
around us so that only the things that cannot be shaken will remain. And sometimes in life we go, Lord, why are you letting everything shake it? Why is everything shaken here? And the reason is that God will shake out our pride, our self-sufficiency, all these things, and we'll be established and settled and firm after we have suffered a little while. Because there's that foundation of our faith that's built that way. And you see him talking about eternal glory, but temporary suffering. See, and even I don't like, as I look at that, I go, I don't like even temporary suffering. You know, temporary suffering, I don't like that. I know, I know, you can say, oh, it's not for long. But, but think of this. Really, these are the choices that people face. Eternal glory after you've suffered a little while or eternal suffering after you've gloried a little while. And you go, hmm, well, I'll take door number one. Thank you very much. Now, verse 11, it says, To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, as you see here, Peter closes out with one last encouragement for us to stand. We looked at the first two already. It was lose your pride, right? Lose your pride, use your guide. And then the third one I said was choose your side. Choose your side. Now, as you think about this, again, I want you to think about what it says there in verse 11 as it closes out this section. It talks about glory and dominion. You know what the word dominion means? It means to dominate. Now, that's a word that's real popular in sports these days and stuff. We're going to dominate and that sort of thing. And maybe that doesn't sound that Christian to you, but realize that it says right there that God is going to dominate eternity. I mean, that God, the God of all grace, don't get the wrong idea here that he's like light on things, that he's wimpy or something. No, no, he's going to dominate the evil that is out there. He is going to triumph over it. And so when you think about it, it says to him, the God of all grace, well, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So as you think about choosing your side, you've seen the sides here tonight because the side is your adversary, the devil, roars, looks around, roams around, looking to see whom he might devour. And then you have the God of all grace, those are the sides that you choose among, that every person chooses among. And when you make it that clear, of course, the choice is very clear. But Satan likes to confuse and likes to make things a little bit more subtle than that. But realize this, the choice you make, the choice I make, the choice we make will affect us forever and ever and ever. So it's a choice to make very, very carefully. See, we talked about humility. We've talked about suffering but make no mistake, God's side wins and is going to dominate forever and ever. Glory and dominion forever and ever. God wins. But he doesn't win because of us. He won in spite of us. That's really important to know. See, that's a part of losing my pride is to realize uh, God doesn't win because of Scott. He won in spite of Scott. See, this last week I played some softball. And if ever there's something to humiliate or humble you, it's to try and play a sport when you're old. So, before the game ever started, though, I knew we were going to dominate. I knew it. Why? Because of the team captain. See, I knew it wasn't because of me. It was in spite of me. Because the captain was the best player. I knew already. I watched him play. And when he chose me to his side, I was like, we just, we're going to dominate. I know I'm going to win. I just became a winner. <laughs> now, He's one of those super athletic guys, you know, who just knocks the cover off the ball, that sort of thing. And so if someone had said, okay, choose your side, which side would you choose? Well, I'm going to choose the side that wins. And so as you look at the team that God has put together, well, it's a bunch of sinners, not a bunch of winners. I mean, look at Peter. You know, God was gracious enough to give us Peter's life in all its glory but all it's not so glory sometimes, you know? And so as it close out, he's going to talk about some of the people he ministered with, and I want to take the time to look at them with you because it's, it's worth looking at. A lot of times we'll get to the end of a letter, like one of these First Peter letters, and he starts giving all the shout-outs, and you're like, I don't know any of these guys. I'm not reading this part. But it's worth reading this part because God has a message for us in it. Every word in God's word matters. So let's look at it. It says, Silvanus, our faithful brother, verse 12, as I consider him, by him I have written to you briefly, uh, exhorting and testifying to you that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. 
So what we see there is that Peter was on the winning side. He was on God's side, but he never stood alone. I mean, this is something we need to see over and over again. God will place great people in your life as you choose your side. As you choose your side, you're on the winning side, but it's amazing how God will put people around you that you say, man, these are special people. These are people like I never knew before I knew the Lord. And that's how this guy was. His name, you might recognize it more as Silas. He was a frequent traveling companion of Paul. And there are some interesting thoughts about this because he says, by Silas, by Silvanus here, this is how I wrote this letter. Now, those who really know Greek, and I'm not one of them, but those scholars who do, they say that 1 Peter was written in very, very correct classical Greek, you know, which is not what you would expect from a guy like Peter. He's a fisherman. I mean, he was a guy who hung out with fish. And so language skills here, as you think about it, way beyond that of a normal Galilean fisherman like Peter. But this is so interesting. He says right here in verse 12, as by Silvanus, he helped me write this. Now, think about this. The humility that it takes. He could have just said, oh, I'm not going to talk about him. I'm just make people think I wrote it, you know. But it, he says, though I may be handpicked, though I may be anointed by God, may I, though I may be the apostle Peter, you know what? When it comes to Greek grammar, <laughs> I get by with a little help from my friends. See, and humility is realizing that not only do we need God, but we need each other. I love that because nobody has every gift. Nobody has every ability. You have God-given gifts that I don't. And it's, it's not humility to say, no, 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 I don't. Yes, you do. But to use them for God's glory. I have gifts that you don't. It's not arrogant to say that. It's just simply a recognition of the fact that God gives us different abilities. And together, we can serve God better. That's what it is to be a part of a local church like this. And so... Then it says in verse 13, this is great. It says, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greet you, and so does Mark, my son. Now, she who's in Babylon, who is that? What are we talking about here? Well, again, this is great. Most scholars agree that she here is a reference to a church, talking to a church, you know, cars and churches are she's. And then Babylon, some of you got that, some of you don't. Okay. Babylon in the Bible often a code word for Rome. That's what they would use for Rome. Why? Because there was persecution, massive persecution going on in Rome. It's the very reason Peter wrote this letter to the dispersion, the people who had had to run away from Rome because of all of the persecution going on there. So he didn't want to draw more attention to the Roman church. And so he uses a little bit of code there and says, hey, the church here in Rome, they say hi to you also. Now, verse 13 uses a word Mark, he uses a name Mark, my son. Now, some would say Peter had a son named Mark. Well, he's a spiritual son to him, not a physical son. He was using that in the analogy there. And it's important to know a little bit about Mark as we close off this book. Why? Because Peter was a leader, right? But the way you could tell Peter was a leader is he poured into other people's lives. He was an other-centered person. See, he actually had this guy named Mark in his life. Now, Mark went on a missionary trip with Paul at one point, but halfway through, well, he flaked. See, I don't know. If someone had been saying, okay, we're just going to stand, and then they looked around, oops, where's Mark? Well, he didn't stand. He fainted. He failed. He blew it, you know. And Paul, being a kind of intense guy, says, well, drag his body away and let's keep going, you know, that sort of thing. And so Paul, even at a later time, when Mark's showing up for the second missionary trip, Paul says, no, 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 no. No, quitters don't go on my trips. And so you see, even Paul maybe had some learning to do. But you see that the end of the line for Mark was not a failure. I love this because this is what you see. God put Peter as a leader in Mark's life, so much so that he calls him his own son here. And if you know your Bible, you know the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark. Well, this is the Mark who wrote it. This is John Mark who wrote it. One, a guy who flaked out on a mission trip ended up being used by God to write one of the gospel accounts. Yep. And many of Peter's worst mistakes, this is awesome, many of Peter's worst mistakes are given great detail in the book of Mark. The, Mark, the book of Mark's pretty short, but it's got a lot of Peter's mistakes. And most scholars agree that it was Peter himself who told him all that stuff, who gave him the details. Oh, make sure you write down that I said this stupid thing. Make sure I said that stupid thing. Don't leave that part out where I said no, Lord, and all that. To encourage someone else to stand 
because he knew what it was to fall. So he could say with that humility and that integrity, you know what, Mark? If God can use me, I guarantee you God can use you. Lose your pride. Use your guide. Choose your side. Mark, make it, make it clear. Make it certain. And even when you fail, even when you fall, you can just fall on God's grace. And that's where he ends in verse 14. He ends the book out. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all you who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So again, as we think of this book, that was a book of encouragement, you know, and we finish it out here. In the midst of pressures, you can have peace. How? By being at peace with God. By being at peace with others. And at being peace with who you are in Christ. But all that is predicated on being in Christ. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be in Christ? Well, the Bible makes it very clear that if you are to be forgiven, if you are to be heaven-bound, that you need to come to Christ, that you need to receive Him, that you need to believe in Him, that you need to put your trust in Him. And that's an opportunity we want to close out here with tonight as we do at every service. Lose your pride. See, that's what you've got to do to come to Christ. Lose your pride. Because every other religious belief comes down to this. If I do this, God will accept me. If I do this list of things, God will accept me. If I'm good enough, if I pray enough, if I give enough, if I do enough, God will accept me. We put different ways on it, but it's all man working his way to God. But losing your pride is to come and say, man, I, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I, I can't do it on my own. I can't help myself. Well, that's a losing of our pride. The second is to use our guide. See, this isn't just a book written by Peter or Paul or any of the rest. This guide here, it's God's guide. This is God's word. It's the Holy Spirit of God teaching us. This is a supernatural book. The more you study it, the more you'll know that. Only a person like I was, who was very ignorant of it, could say, oh, it's full of contradictions. Really? Show me one. Well, I don't know. They're in there somewhere. I don't read it. You know, only somebody who really is ignorant of this doesn't understand its supernatural character. The more you know it, the more you realize there's no way man made this up. And so losing your pride, using your guide, the Bible tells us how to do it. It says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish, would not be devoured by the lion, but would have life. And then the last part, this is the opportunity you have here today. It's the responsibility that God has given each one of us is to choose your side, to choose your side. A lot of people say, well, I got no beef with God. I'm all right with him, you know. I'm kind of undecided, you know. I'm in the other category or whatever. But Jesus makes it so clear there isn't an other category. He said, if you're not for me, the default is against me. See, it's a decision. It's a declaration. Choose your side. Choose this day, the Bible says, whom you will serve. And again, it makes all the sense in the world. We talked about it tonight. Choose your side. Which side? God's side, the winning side. See, God resists the proud, but he cannot resist the humble. He just can't resist them. If somebody comes to him humbly with faith and says, Lord, I, I need you, he can't resist that. The Bible says he will never cast that person out. And so as we close here tonight, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and I'm going to give you an opportunity right there in your seat. If you know you need the Lord, if you know you need to choose your side tonight, if you're not 100% sure that you have settled the issues of eternity, I'm just going to give you an opportunity here tonight to choose your side and to make that known by raising your hand. If you're here tonight and you know you need Christ in your life, just raise your hand there in your seat. I see you over here. God bless you, both of you. God bless you there in the back. Anyone else saying, hey, I want to pray a prayer of acceptance of Christ here tonight. I want to give my life to him. I want to choose my side. Anyone else here tonight? Don't let your pride keep you from a decision like this. It's a very important one. For you who raised your hand over there, I'm just going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. It's a prayer of dedication. And Lord, I pray that you would come into their hearts in a real and powerful way as they pray this. Father, I thank you for sending your son to die for my sin. I believe 
that he paid the price to give me life, and that he rose again three days later. And Lord, I want to follow you. I pray that you would forgive me, that you would give me life, and that you would free me to follow you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We're going to close out with a song here. What I'm going to do is encourage all of us to stand. But those of you who raised your hand, if you prayed that prayer tonight and you made that commitment, I'm going to ask you to make a bold move, which is to get up out of your seat as we all stand and meet me right down here. I'd like to give you this guide, first of all, but also just give you an opportunity to make a public declaration of that faith that you professed here tonight. So let's all stand. And those of you who raised your hand and prayed that prayer, just come on down and meet me right here.